So my first thing is frontal sinus surgery. You know, when I was a trainee, it was very complicatedly taught. A lot about the embryology, many different variations, and it didn't leave the surgeon with a very clear idea of what you're trying to do. So for me, when it comes to the frontal sinus, much like we teach straightforward sphenoethmoidectomy, we talk about the frontal sinus just being a box. On the left-hand side for the frontal sinus, the, the medial boundary is the middle turbinate. The lateral boundary is the orbital wall. The posterior boundary is the skull base. And then anteriorly, you have the nasofrontal beak. If you look endoscopically, this is a frontal sinusotomy in which you can see the boundaries here. The nasofrontal beak is the anterior boundary. The po posterior boundary is the ethmoid roof becoming the posterior table. The orbital wall becomes the orbital roof laterally. And then the middle terminate becomes the intersinus septum medially. This is what's important. So when you see the cells here, I discourage my trainees initially from trying to understand exactly where the drainage pathway is. I ask them to go and find the boundaries of the frontal recess. Because for many of us, trying to find the clefts and spaces is not possible when there is pathology and prior surgery. And it's really the fixed landmarks the fixed anatomy that we're looking for. So yes, you can say this is agonazi, suprabulla and bulla, and that may be somewhere in between the frontal sinus drains through here. But to me, this is not how we should be teaching anatomy, especially for people starting FES. We should really teach them how to find these boundaries first. This is what is more important, in my opinion, following the orbit up, following the middle turbine up. Now, of course, when you know how to do a sphenoethmoidectomy in the same way, then really adding the box into the whole thing just creates a sinus cavity that is like this. This is really how a sinus cavity should look. A sphenoethmoidectomy and a vertical box that becomes a frontal. Now, if you said to me, how do we go about doing this then? We do this technique called Carolyn's Window. Now, it's all about making it easy. Please ignore the Japanese because I gave this talk a little while ago in Japan. But it's all about, for me, as a skull-based surgeon, I don't like using angled endoscopes unless I have to. So I really want to use a zero-degree scope to see what I'm looking at. And in particular, I really like a straight instrument. So I... I don't like working with curved instrumentation. When you start using curved instrumentation, your dexterity decreases because of the radius and arc of the instrument. So I try very hard to use straight instruments. So let me show you how this technique evolved. So this is not how we do it now. This was one of the very first cases where a gentleman had a very large osteoma of the orbit We'd left him without a great result from tumor, but he had a bit of frontal sinus dysfunction. And so we came back to, rem to get access to the frontal sinus. Now, for me, when I looked at his anatomy, I said, look, we just need to remove this little block of bone. And so early on, what we did is we just simply scored off the mucosa with a diathermy, removed the mucosa, and then drilled the bone away. Now, this bone that we're drilling away is the bone that is in front of the agonazi and then becomes part of the nasofrontal beak. Now, when you take this bone off, you are exposing the front wall of the, the frontal sinus or the frontal recess really here. And you can put a straight shaver in and it really gives you great access here. You can see almost up to the top here. We're still using a straight instrument, but I've got a, a hoseman punch but it's still got the straight scope in, the zero degree. And even the quad cut comes back in here. This is a straight shaver. And you can see that just by taking that window off, you get great access. And if we go back to what we've done here, this is what's happened. We've taken this segment off. The, the entire axilla gets removed. Now, this is not new. 
my colleague PJ Wormold talks about doing a little flap here. Jim Palmer talks about nibbling it with a kerosene. But what is new, in my opinion, is the fact that we remove the entire bone and we do it in a way now that gives us much better access. And I'm going to take you through this journey. The first time I used it was for hyperplastic sinuses. So I originally had people who you can see on the left-hand side that had partial surgery, not doing very well. Now, this is three months post-surgery on the right. Now, on the right, yes, there's a little bit of crusting now. But really, we've given this person a, a very open ethmoid. But this man does not have frontal sinuses. He's got those hypoplastic sinuses. And you can see we've created this large removal of the axilla in a person who had no frontal sinus. So when you have no frontal sinus, it's not possible to do a draft three or something extended. You have to do something like this. Now, and that's, we started using this technique mostly for patients who didn't have a frontal sinus or a very small one, but it's now become something we use all the time. Now, if you look at a sagittal view, if you said to me, this is the midline, this is not really where you are though, when you do frontal sinus surgery or frontal recess surgery, you're, you're parasagittal or off the midline. It's about this view here where you can see the beak and the agonazi. This bone here is what we remove. And so, you know, it's not simply just removing the front wall of the agonazi. We actually take the bone, oh, whoops. My apologies, I don't know what happened there. We take the bone, the entire bone here. So there's, there's, the, there's the bone there. We take that entire thing. And when we do that, we get zero degree access directly into the frontal sinus. It is not something that you can do with just a kerosene. You have to use a drill for this technique. Here's a gentleman who has the so-called CCAD. We're going to talk about this in my next lecture. And um, he's got terrible barrow trauma. He even gets uh, pain when he flies in his uh, B2 division. He even gets numbness on his face when he flies. So not a huge amount to see endoscopically, just the classic middle turbinate edema that you see in central compartment atopic sinus disease. And here we are now at the end of the case where we've done the sphenoethmoidectomy. And we're going to now do the frontal sinus. And I want to just take you through how we started doing it. So we, we once again, we started doing this on, on pretty much everyone and we would just take away the mucosa and start drilling. Now, I show you this old video. This is about seven years old now, but I show it to you because it by showing where we actually remove the mucosa, I think it helps you understand what is the bone that we're going to remove. It's very quick to remove the front wall of the frontal sinus. And you're still using a zero degree scope, the straight shaver. It's very then easy to remove the partition. So you can see it's very pneumatized here, big optic nerve, skull base, skull base, skull base. There's the anterothmoral artery. And you've got that view with a zero degree scope. Now, here in a moment, we used to just put a little free graft of mucosa over that bit of bone, and then we'd pack it. Now, that healed okay. It wasn't perfect, but it healed okay. And you can see up here, there's, he's doing okay there. There's a little bit of crusting. You can see at three weeks, there's a bit of crusting. And then when he reaches three months, he's got a good result at three months, but there was a bit of crusting around the raw bone and the free graft doesn't always take. And so we'll go to the other side here in a moment. You'll have a look up there. That's healed pretty well. And look at the view you get with a zero degree scope. This is not looking with an angled scope, just a zero degree scope. Now, we started trying to preserve the mucosa and some of the early iterations, we were still remaining very limited here. So we preserve this bit of mucosa, trying hard to maybe not manipulate the soft tissues very much. This was an, this was an improvement but when we pulled this mucosa back and then worked around it, it was very awkward. Now, I don't think this video really shows how awkward it is. If you can imagine as the operator, that little flap you just raised is right next to the endoscope. 
And look, maybe for me, I'm making it look okay, but but that's very awkward, that, that flap to be sitting right next to the endoscope. But using the small flap, it meant that we could preserve the mucosa. We could continue drilling the bone. You can see we've removed the entire wall of the frontal sinus or the frontal recess, I should say. So once you've removed the entire wall of the frontal recess, you can just then simply use with a zero degree scope, a mix of kerosens and shaver and sometimes a punch. And then you get this view here. So there's the end cavity. When you look up here now, this is just a zero degree scope looking up into the posterior table. And of course the flap, you could even take a little bit more bone there if we wanted to, but the flap gets returned and then there's no free graft um, over the main area. When you do take the flap, there still is a little bit of raw bone. So we still would put a tiny bit of free graft in, but the bit anteriorly was actually a small flap and the flap is actually would heal always better than a free graft. So you can see that little bit of free graft. And sure enough, when we started to preserve the mucosa and create a little flap, we got really nice healing. So the cavity healed really nice. And what you're looking at now is almost like just a really nice giant middle meatus. It's as if someone had a really favorable anatomy to do your sinus surgery. And this is important because this look is excellent where you can just look straight up and it's like a giant middle meatus. You've just got this huge big opening up into the frontal, very nice opening and a very easy zero degree view look. Now, I was giving a course in Sydney. This is maybe 2018 and Brad Woodworth was one of our guests and, and Brad said to me, no, no, you've got to make the flap much bigger and drop it down and make it inferiorly. So that's what we've evolved to. So somewhere with Brad, we now do a flap that looks like this. So we start right up at the top of the nose and we follow the root of the very top. We find the piriform aperture. So this flap goes all the way to the piriform aperture and then we fold it down. So it is now an inferiorly based flap, but very broad. It comes all the way down to the piriform aperture. Now, when we fold it down, you've got fantastic access and the flap is not in your way. This makes such a difference. Having the flap out of the way and exposing this area makes the drilling really easy. Now, I show you this last because now that the flap is so big and broad, you, you don't really, you're exposing more bone than you actually need to for the drill, but you get this lovely view with the flap. And I think showing our evolution of our approach really gives you a better idea of what we need to drill here. Now, you can see this gentleman's got a great looking sinus cavity. We're using a shaver and the flap gets returned. The whole thing's done with a zero degree scope. It's not a low throp. It's really just a draft 2A, but done where the entire axilla is removed. And of course, these sinus cavities heal really nice. So when you look up now, Sometimes you get a small adhesion, but you get this really nice giant look up into the frontal sinus, just with a zero degree, you can almost look. Now I'm gonna take you through now our final case. This final case now is our sort of current technique. And someone said to me, Richard, okay, so you're doing this for complicated surgery or tumors. It's not correct. This is our standard frontal sinus surgery technique now. We don't, spend a lot of time doing angled instrumentation. We remove the axilla and the anterior to posterior beak in every case where we think we have to do frontal recess surgery. So if we're gonna do frontal recess surgery, this is just our standard approach. Surprisingly to some that people are not more or less comfortable than if you nibble the bone with kerosens and other things, simply removing the bone here doesn't create more pain. And in fact, actually taking more bone and minimizing the amount of exposed bone at the end of the operation actually gives patients a better result, I think, in terms of comfort level. So we now use this 30,000 
four millimeter burr. I think the straight burr here has a 15 degree sort of bend on it, but the whole thing is essentially a straight instrument and we've got a zero degree scope. You can see the periosteum's been found laterally and the drilling remains lateral to the middle turbinate. This is what is important. And here at the end of the case, you can see right up to the frontal sinus, the flap goes back in. There's the flap gets pushed up. Now, someone asked me, what else do we do? So I still will, when I went the end of the case, when we've got a nice cavity here, you can see the mucosal preservation is good. We'll put in this, we'll put in a small free graft because when you return the lateral wall mucosa, there is still sometimes a little bit of bone anteriorly inside the frontal recess. But coming in from the front is very mucosal preserving, just like it is in an outside Lothrop. So we, we place a small graft in and then we put our little sponge over the top. Now, it makes frontal sinus surgery easy, not just because you're using a zero degree scope, but it's because of this issue. So Claudio gave me this matrix. This is from the International Frontal Sinus Classification Group that PJ and Alki, my colleagues, uh, were part of. And they, through a group of international experts, came up with this matrix that talked about what makes frontal recess surgery complicated. Well, it's partly due to the number of cells on the vertical axis around the frontal sinus. And then it's the AP diameter that we're working in that makes it complex. Now you can see when the AP diameter is small down the bottom right corner, this is where the highest complexity is. But when you do a Carolyn's window approach and you remove the anterior to posterior bone, you're taking this entire part of the matrix out of the equation and you are simplifying frontal sinus surgery because you are drilling the bone there is no worry about the anterior to posterior diameter anymore it is just the number of partitions there and once you do that we started to do this technique yes in tumors yes in people that are hyperplastic but now it's what we do every single time and for us now it just gives us these lovely sinus cavities that just have a very big sort of middle meatus opening. And it gives just a really nice final look, even if it, it scars down a little bit around the top and the apex, a lot, most of the time you still end up with a very, very nice opening. And, you know, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, we've almost extended it across and you might even call that like a 2B or a hemi lothrop. So this is what we're doing now. And, and if you said to me, look, it, does it make the surgery easier? For sure, in my mind, it's quick, very quick. I can't tell you how quick it is, but it actually also improves irrigation. And this is one of my colleagues, uh, Jonathan Overdice, published a nice study with Dave Geddes and, and uh, they looked at a cadaver model where they compared two different ways of doing a draft two, essentially where there was, where there was limited removal and a, a, a and my apologies, there's removal of what they called the middle turbinate axilla nasi complex. Now, this is essentially the same bone that I'm talking about in a Carolyn's window. They, uh, they published this a while ago. So it's, um, it's, they, they didn't really refer to our publication. It was their own sort of concept here. And they did a draft two AVAR angled instrumentation. And what they showed was that in a cadaver model, when you irrigated the nose, much better irrigation went up to the frontal sinus. If you could visualize the frontal sinus with a zero degree endoscope. So they said that by removing the middle turbinate axilla agonizi complex, as they called it, which is the bone that I'm describing in, in Carolyn's window, they actually, if you could create a zero degree view into the frontal sinus, you did very, very well in terms of better irrigation than someone who used a 70 degree or an angled endoscope around the corner. And not surprisingly, that would be the case. You know, irrigation fluid has to make a 90 degree or 70 degree bend to get up to the frontal sinus otherwise. So in summary, Carolyn's window is, is the axillectomy, not the axillotomy of frontal sinuses. It provides a zero degree endoscope approach for most frontal sinuses. 
It makes it easy because it removes that AP diameter and, and creating a, a sort of a modified Woodworth flap where you remove really based on an inferior pedicle, the entire lateral wall mucosa down at the piriform, do your drilling and then return the mucosa. It does incredibly well. And it gives you this lovely sort of giant middle meatus appearance. And if you said to me, golly, who do I do this for? I do it for tumors, barotrauma, people with CCAD. It, it hasn't replaced draft three. So I still do draft threes a lot for when there's when there's lateral tumors in the frontal recess um, or tumors actually in the frontal sinus itself. I, I certainly still do draft threes for people with severe eosinophilic disease. And so, so while it's a fantastic you know, technique, it doesn't replace a low trop. It's, it's just the way in which we now do frontal sinus work. And look, on that note, I'm going to finish. And I, I know I haven't taken half an hour because I left some time for Q&A. But, but I do appreciate I'm speaking to some people who English may be their second language. And if you've missed anything, I regularly post my lectures and videos on my YouTube channel. And so my YouTube channel is probably my main avenue for which now most people who want to look back at a net lecture or a video will go to. It's very easy. It's at Nose and Sinus. It's Professor Richard Harvey at YouTube. Please subscribe and sign up so you get a notification when I post my next lecture. And uh, thank you very much for your time.